Here is our uh, first slide. So it gives me great pleasure today to introduce uh, cancer, to introduce Ajit Bajaj. Uh, Ajit is a good friend and partner in crime, and and I will refer to him uh, alternatively, Ajit and baggage. his baggage <laughs> and he is one of the most illustrious graduates of one of the finest schools in India. Sorry I'm back on. Uh, there uh, you are. <laughs> and okay, my apologies. Rajit, I, I have my screen on so okay, that's perfect. fine. Yeah. Okay perfect. So let me I'm sorry I got I, I <laughs> technical problems on my end so let <laughs> me just finish so as I was saying, baggage is a wonderful example of an old adage. When you do what you love, it's no longer a job. From the early age of 13, he was introduced into mountain climbing by climbing Friendship Peak. Then at 16, he summited Hanuman Tibba. I have the distinct pleasure of knowing Ajit as a classmate and friend for 40 plus years. He's an inspiring, thoughtful, and civic-minded leader. With that, let me turn it over to... Uh, we aren't hearing you, Ranjit. What you want? It's time to speak. I can. I will. I must. Okay. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's just me. Okay. All right. Um, All right. With that baggage, if you would take over. Sure. Uh, good evening. Well, it's evening here in India, and good morning to all of you in the U.S. Um, thank you so much, Ranjit. Ranjit um, is a dear buddy from school and college. I see. Rahul Sandhi here as well. Um, so I would like to begin with a confession. I have the best profession on the planet. When I graduated from college and uh, all my friends, including Ranjit and Rahul here, were getting real jobs in the real world. Uh, and when I told them that I was going to pursue my hobby, which was adventure and make it my profession. They thought that I had lost it completely. Um, well, I joke about this, but this is how I commute to work. This is a 400 meter zip line across the Ganga River that takes me to one of the camps we, we operate. This is called um, Leopard Heights. It's across the Ganges River. And uh, I know Ranjit and Romi have uh, both zipped across as well. So today, luckily, all my friends do realize that if you're passionate about what you do, you don't work for a single day of your life. Um, I was very lucky when I was in college. Um, I had the proud privilege of meeting Sir Edmund Hillary and going whitewater rafting with him on two occasions. In our world of adventure, Sir Edmund Hillary, he rose to heights higher than Mount Everest. And the reason is because post Mount Everest, um, when he was really famous, he used his fame for doing a lot of good work for the Sherpa people of Nepal. He, he built schools and hospitals for them, raised a lot of money. And till today, they worship him in Nepal. And so that's why we believe that Sir Edmund Hillary rose to heights higher than Mount Everest. This quest for adventure has taken me down some of the wildest rivers on the planet. This is the Choru River in Turkey. And this is close to all of you. This is um, what is called the Channel of Death on the Alsek River in Alaska. And uh, this is one of the wildest rivers on the planet. This is the Zambezi River. And you start a rafting trip down this beautiful river, which is in a gorge below Victoria Falls, which is one of the seven natural wonders of the world. That's a 16 foot raft. And it has disappeared completely in the rapid. But it's not just the wild rapids that make rafting the Zambezi a real challenge. It is the presence of these big crocodiles, uh, the Nile crocodile that hang out in the calm pools 
below those big, wild, crazy rapids. I started climbing when I was in school and uh, I guess one of the reasons uh, Ranjit and I are such close buddies is because uh, we started climbing together and uh, this was later on in, um, in, in college. This is in the French Alps. Um, and this was on my 21st birthday with a very dear friend who is a doctor, a professor at uh, UPenn, uh, Teji. He might be joining us a little bit later today. So we, we climbed this mountain, which is about 7,000 meters high on my 21st birthday. And Teji, who was one of my mentors, um, was kind enough to carry a chocolate all the way up. So what I'm actually doing there is cutting a chocolate with a Swiss army knife. So we are moving on to an expedition to ski to the geographical North Pole, 90 degrees North latitude. Well done, good one. And here goes the sled. So that was a very dear friend of mine, Dirk. Um, I had to go and uh, help him and stop filming uh, after his sled went into that crevice. And below that, you have the Arctic Ocean. So when you ski to the North Pole, you're actually skiing on a thin layer of ice, which is two to three meters thick. So people invariably ask me, why do I do these crazy things? And I think looking at this photograph, close to the, north, the geographical North Pole, 90 degrees North latitude, I think you have the answer. It's a great feeling of just being thousands and thousands of miles away um, from our so-called civilization in pristine wilderness. All you have is a few close buddies, and in this case, a few polar bears as well. And well, there are still people who don't understand the virtues of an outdoor existence. And to them, my answer is try it and you will know why. This is the North Pole, uh, 90 degrees North latitude, as I said, the very top of our planet. Um, as an aside, I'd like to tell you that I um, got to the North Pole a um, couple of days before we got there. We had faced temperatures going down to minus 65 degrees Celsius with the wind chill factor. And from the North Pole, we were picked up by a helicopter. And eight days later, I was back home in India in May when the temperature goes up to 44 degrees Celsius. It's amazing how quickly the human body can um, adapt. Well, I'll never forget this photograph. Six months after I skied to the North Pole, uh, this little twin otter dropped us off to the starting point of our ski expedition to the South Pole and took off. And uh, well, we faced what are probably some of the worst conditions on the planet. But a few weeks later, I was lucky enough to get to the South Pole, the very bottom of our planet. Um, and it was minus 45 degrees Celsius when this photograph was taken. And I'm wearing a mask, frozen stiff. But I don't know if you can tell, but I'm smiling big time. And the reason really is because this was a childhood dream come true. I think there's nothing that gives you more joy and happiness in life than uh, dreaming, dreaming big, facing a lot of storms and challenges and um, being able to achieve your dreams. So I thought I knew what the spirit of adventure was all about till I got my two best adventure buddies, my two daughters. And this next video is set to a Bollywood song. Um, this is something I did with my daughters. Um, the, you know, this was uh, a scuba diving trip and we went down and this dance was to wish my wife a very happy birthday. Love you, Mama. Happy birthday. 
So my elder, my younger daughter um, and my elder daughter both enjoy the, the outdoors. But my younger daughter is more creative. She's a great singer. Uh, she's a taekwondo black belt, a rescue diver. But Dia, my elder daughter, she enjoys the more extreme stuff. That's a photo of hers uh, kayaking a river called the Moose in the US. Um, Dia was all of 14 years old when we did our first major expedition. This was an 18 day sea kayaking expedition along the fjords of West Greenland. We saw Arctic foxes, we saw blue whales, and it was just a fantastic experience. Um, that's Dia. And one of the things we did see that I'd like to share with you that we did see a lot of signs and symptoms of global warming. Um, because the Arctic regions have warmed up by more than a degree and a half in the last two decades, um, mosquitoes, for instance, are breeding in wild profusion. So we had to wear these nets around, our, around us. And you can see the mosquitoes on the, on the net. And these glaciers that we saw were also receding. This is how icebergs are made. These glaciers, they carve off into the Arctic Ocean. Oh. And um, that's how you get these glaciers. But you can see how you can see the terminal and the lateral moraine of these glaciers. And you can see quite easily that these glaciers have receded quite dramatically. And what you see on top is the Greenland ice cap. And while we were kayaking in Greenland, um, Tia and I decided that we wanted to ski across the Greenland ice cap. Now the Greenland ice cap is the second largest chunk of ice on our planet. And there's 650,000 square miles of ice. And sadly, it is melting very rapidly. Uh, Greenland is considered ground zero for the climate crisis. I was a very nervous father when this photograph was taken. Um, we flew on this twin otter to the edge of the Greenland ice cap close to the west coast. Dia was the youngest person on the planet to be attempting to ski about 600 kilometers, which would be, I guess, about um, 380 miles or so um, from the west to the east coast of Greenland. We were going to cross um, country ski all the way across. Um, so that's, that's our skiing through a blizzard. And that's camping on the Arctic ice. You can see our huskies at the back. We had, we had these two dog sleds with us. And the Huskies stored all the gear for us. We, of course, had 24 hours of daylight. That's our Kiwi uh, team member called Tony. And we started calling him Tony the Walrus after this shot was taken. So Dee and I were the first crazy Indians to ski across the Greenland ice cap. And um, Dia was the youngest person on the planet to have achieved this feat. After that, Dia went off for four years. She went to Cornell University. And, um, um, but just before she left, um, my way of saying goodbye to my daughter, who's right here with me right now, was, um, well, we, we climbed uh, this beautiful mountain called Elbrus, which is the highest mountain in Europe, um, in, in Russia. So we traversed, we climbed from the north side up to the summit. You see the summit behind us. And then we came down the normal route, the south side, all the way back down. This is the summit of Mount Everest. Now, Mount Everest demarcates the border between Nepal, which is to your right, and Tibet, which is to your left. Most people climb from Nepal. Um, you have to cross what is called the Khumbu Ice Fall. But the north face, as you can see here, is steeper. There's more wind, it's colder, it's much harder. But we decided to climb Mount Everest from the north side. And we started training. So we did four training expeditions to, um, to train for Mount Everest. This was our first training expedition. We climbed a mountain called Kangyatse, which is about as high as Mount McKinley or Denali in Alaska. You can see the 
smooth brown rolling hills of Ladakh at the back. And over Christmas in 2017, we spent a couple of weeks high altitude trekking in winter conditions in Nepal. We also met our Sherpas and bought most of our equipment. You can see Mount Everest at the back. And then we went climbing in the French Alps close to Chamonix. And that's Dia going climbing a frozen waterfall. And after that, we still wanted to train some more. And um, we thought, what better way to train than to go out in search of the snow leopard high up in the Himalaya. And we were very lucky in the two weeks that we spent in Ladakh in winter conditions, Dia and I had four sightings of the snow leopard. We thought that this was a good omen for our climb. I I'm joined by Dia now and uh, Dia, over to you. Hi everyone. So I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about our journey from here on out. So basically after a year of almost eating, sleeping and breathing Everest, we finally made it to base camp. And this is what base camp on the north side looks like. Um, when we got there, we could actually see uh, Mount Everest. It was a beautiful, clear day. Sagar Mata, as they call her in Nepali. And, you know, a lot of people talk about conquering mountains or conquering Mother Nature. Um, when you reach base camp and you look up at this big, beautiful mountain in front of you, you realize that there's absolutely no such thing as actually conquering a mountain. You know, if anything, you feel grateful, you feel humbled just to be there and to have the opportunity to do something like this. Um, also, before you go any further up the mountain, you actually spend a week acclimatizing at base camp. And before you go any up further, we have we had a big puja ceremony done by the um, Sherpa people. And uh, they actually had uh, given us a prashad at the end of the, the um, prayer ceremony that we had to have. And uh, this prashad was actually either a can of beer or a shot of whiskey. And both dad and I hadn't been drinking at all for the past like three or four months before leading up to the climb. And so... You know, I think after this, both of us wanted to convert to Buddhism. Um, so this is what the route up to the summit looks like. Um, and the reason why an expedition like this takes so long is because you have to spend a lot of time acclimatizing. So if you were to just go directly up to the summit, you would die within three and a half minutes, which is why you spend your time slowly making your way up. So we actually spent about a week and a half, two weeks at base camp before climbing any further up. We made our way up to advanced base camp, spent six days there, climbed up to North Call, spent a night there, climbed up a little bit further on the way to camp two, and then came all the way back down and waited at base camp till we had a clear weather window to, to then attempt the summit. And the weather window we're looking for is about eight to 10 days of clear weather um, so that we could do our summit attempt. And when we're doing the summit attempt beyond North Col, um, that's, that's 23,000 feet or 7,000 meters, we were using supplemental oxygen. And you'll see some pictures of that as well. Hello. Uh, this is, yes? Sorry, someone? Oh. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is what the, the route up to the summit looks like. Um, and as you can see, it starts off with a mixed terrain of ice and rock, and then everything beyond advanced base camp is pretty much just snow and ice. Um, this is what the climb up to uh, camp one looks like. It's basically a wall of, of ice that you have to climb up. And this is one of the more difficult stretches because you're not on the oxygen yet, but you're pretty high up. Um, and each and every, it's very, very steep. And each and every step that you're taking you're sort of taking one step and then stopping for three, three, like, you know, breaths and then taking another step and then stopping for three breaths. So it's slow going, it's tedious um, and, and very, very exhausting. Um, this is what, again, climbing looks like. This is what this, the scenery is to give you some perspective. That's Dia climbing to the North Pole. And 
this is camp one now. So everything beyond here, you're attached to a rope all the time. Even if you want to go out to pee or poo or anything, you have to be attached to a rope. On one side of camp one, there's a huge crevice going down into God knows where. And on the other side is, is a very, very quick ticket to um, advanced base camp. So, so you have to be, you know, sort of on, on your ball. You can't make a mistake over here. And on the, you know, you have to sort of be concentrating um, and, and making sure that you, you don't make any silly mistakes here on out because um, even a small error could lead to a very, very big consequence. Um, and we're now in our down suits, you know, we, we, this is now what the climb up to camp two looks like. Um, again, it's, it's pretty slow going, you're attached to the rope. Um, and, and this is actually where we had one of our toughest days on the mountain. We encountered a big storm and it was honestly one of the most frightening things that I think both dad and I have ever experienced. The wind speeds were so high, it almost felt like we were going to be blown off the face of the earth. Um, to be fair, we were, of course, attached to a rope. But at this point, you know, you're so cold, you're so exhausted. The wind is blowing directly in your face. And it's a very, very narrow path that you're trying to uh, navigate. And, and it's, it's, it's in situations like this where you really, truly feel like questioning why you're up there, you know. And it's definitely in situations like this where you want to stop, um, where you're kind of, you know, like calculating all these things in your head and wondering why you're doing what you're doing for fun. Um, but it's also in times like this where you realize how important it is to stay positive. I think, um, you know, this, this is definitely a situation which shows you how mentally strong you have to be because stopping over here isn't an option, right? If you stop, not only are you putting yourself in danger because the minute you stop, your body stops generating heat and you get very, very cold, very, very fast. But also if you stop, you're stopping all the people behind you who are again, can't really go um, across you because the path is too narrow. So you're not only putting yourself in danger, but you're putting the five or six people in your team who are behind you in danger as well. And that sort of, you know, puts everything into perspective and sort of, you know, you, you have to keep going, if not for yourself, then for your team. And uh, you just have to stay positive. And so at this point, I'd like to share our not so secret formula to success because honestly, we tell <laughs> but um, it's, it's obviously in a handy acronym pods. Um, and so the P in pods stands for preparation. And I think dad and I both have realized that no matter what we do, you know, mountain or not, there's no substitute for good preparation, excellent preparation, you know, doing each and every single thing that you possibly can. To, to make sure that you're ready for anything that you might encounter on the mountain. The O in pod stands for outlook. And uh, I think having a positive outlook on the mountain and in life is so, so important. Um, we were joking about this previously, but we kind of feel like all of our expeditions have been basically one training, uh, one big training expedition for this whole staying at home situation. Um, you know, oftentimes when we're on the mountain, we're stuck in a tent with absolutely no access to Wi-Fi, internet, other people. And it's just dad and me in this tiny little tent. You can't go outside because the weather's bad and you can't like, you know, move any further up the mountain. And it can get pretty um, frustrating and monotonous and it's difficult. And, you know, those are the times which, which are often not spoken about. Um, but there are definitely lots of parallels to, to this time that I think a lot of us are experiencing and facing, except right now, it's definitely a lot more comfortable being at home instead of a little tiny tent. Um, so that's O of pods. The D in pods is about always being deliberate. And that's, again, being very, very aware and certain of each and every movement that you make on the mountain. Um, this is an error-free environment. You know, one small mistake could have um, deathly consequences even. So you have to be aware at all times. And finally, the S in pods is for support and society. I think there's no way, firstly, we could do this without our mountain guides, our Sherpas. There's no way we could have done this without our family and friends. You know, all the love and support that we got when you're out on the mountain, 
Um, that Ranjit sort of was in touch with me yes. throughout. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ranjit Anko was on, on messaging dad, I think, throughout as well. And uh, there's definitely no substitute for that strong support system. I feel like, you know, that that really, really does um, give you a lot of energy and uh, a lot of confidence or gives you gives you that extra push when you need it. Um, and also, I think it makes you very, very aware of uh, society and how we all live very, very privileged lives. And, you know, on the mountain, it's back to the basics. But after our expeditions, we always get to come back and come back to normal life. Um, so I think, I think being on expeditions when, and doing this sort of gives us um, an added appreciation for, for the people who aren't as fortunate as us and sort of gives us this, this drive to try and give back however we can. Okay, back to dad. So we got to camp two on Mount Everest. Uh, this is at about 8,000 meters after the storm. As you can see, our tents are buried in the snow. So we dug our tents out, got in, and the storm started all over again. I thought we were going to get blown off the mountain or our tent was going to rip apart. But uh, luckily, the weather gods were kind. We stayed up. I did not sleep that night. I slept with my boots on. The weather gods were kind. And at about 5.30 in the morning, the storm abated. And we slept for two hours. We woke up. We forced ourselves to eat forced ourselves to eat because um, you lose your appetite completely. I lost 12 kilos on this expedition. And so if any of you would are thinking of losing weight while eating all you can, I would strongly recommend an expedition like climbing Mount Everest. Um, so we started up the mountain. We were now over 8,000 meters using oxygen. Um, this is the so-called death zone. It's called the death zone because we human beings are not supposed to be there. Um, and if something does happen to you, we have a term out of doors called AMF yo-yo. Now Dia is here, so I'll give you the politer version. AMF yo-yo stands for adios my friend. You're on your own. We got to our camp. Uh, uh, camp three, which is about 8,200 meters. And this is probably the best view I've ever had. We had a view of Mount Everest on the left and an 8,000 meter drop all the way down to the East Rongbuk Glacier to our right. We started climbing at nine o'clock at night. The temperature was minus 50 degrees Celsius. This is what it was like climbing at night. It's very slow because um, there's very little oxygen. A, it's very steep and B, there's very little oxygen. So you take two or three steps and you stop, you catch up your breath and you keep going. You don't stop. So we climbed through the night and um, at 3 a.m. In the morning, when we were a very tantalizingly close to the summit of Mount Everest, something went wrong with me. We had been climbing super strong all night, but suddenly, I don't know what it was, but um, I just couldn't breathe. Finally, I realized that the tube supplying oxygen to my mask had frozen. And when I pulled out my mask, I could start breathing again. So this was perhaps one of the worst situations of my life, being so close to the summit of Everest, not being able to breathe, but most importantly, I had my daughter with me and I'd promised my wife that whatever we did, we were gonna do this together and I was gonna guard Dia with my life. Um, so 3 a.m. in the morning, minus 50 degrees Celsius, pitch dark, you're on a steep slope, you're fuzzy brained, what do you do? I took a decision. I decided to let Dia go to the summit with one of our Sherpas. I stayed behind 
I was trying to follow Dia very, very slowly because suddenly, without oxygen, the going became really, really hard and painful. But I did have the presence of mind to radio a Sherpa Sardar who was climbing about 20 minutes below us. I called him on the radio and I told him that um, I'm continuing to the summit. My, I, I have problems with my oxygen mask. And um, Nima Nuru caught up with me. And as luck would have it, he had a spare oxygen mask. I changed it and cranked up my oxygen levels and tried to follow Dia as fast as I could. I was really, really worried because we had a couple of treacherous pitches between where we were and the summit. And well, it was straight out of a Bollywood movie. At first light, as I approached the summit of Mount Everest, I was looking out for, both Dia and I had matching orange helmets, and I was looking out for an orange helmet. And um, when I saw that orange helmet on the summit of Mount Everest, it was a huge relief for me. And unfurling the Indian tricolor on the summit of Mount Everest was a very proud and emotional moment for both of us. I think both of us teared up. And um, there was also a very strong message Dia and I wanted to give about the girl child. We were the first, we, we, we got to know this later. We don't climb for records. We were the first parent-child team from India, but the first parent-child team on the planet to have climbed Mount Everest from the harder north side. And uh, the message we wanted to give out was that given an opportunity, there is nothing that our girls can't achieve. And if we are to harness this immense potential, not just in India, but all over the world, our girls can take us quite literally to the next orbit. But after the euphoria of being there and unfurling the Indian tricolor, we looked down on the Northeast Ridge and the way we had taken to climb up and the way down looked treacherous. Most of the accidents while climbing happen on the way down. And we hadn't slept for two nights. So we sat down and I told Dia, let's drink a bit of water. We forced ourselves to eat something and uh, we had to concentrate. You just can't afford a single mistake. There are these two pitches just below the summit of Mount Everest where you have a drop off about 10,000 feet to your left as you traverse on this rock, on these two rock pitches on the way down. You can see Mount Everest at the back and this is the third step on Mount Everest. Now there is a 6.5% mortality rate for every person who gets to the top of Mount Everest. And one of the hardest pitches, which is what probably defeated Mallory and Irvin, the famous British climbers who were lost on Mount Everest in way back in 1924, was this treacherous second step on Mount Everest, which is about a 200 foot vertical rock pitch. And you can see a frozen body below us to the left in the middle of the screen. And that is something that does freak you out. The day we got to the summit, we were on our feet for 20 hours. And uh, 
we got all the way back down to the north pole the idea is to go as low down the mountain as you possibly can this photograph was taken on the next day on our way down from the north pole and we were very lucky one of our sherpa team members slipped and uh, fell for about 20 meters very luckily for us you know uh, he was anchored onto the rope um, he was safe he lost his rucksack which went into a crevice and um, which was about 100 meters deep but we were just so happy that our buddy was safe um we had all kinds of incidents on the mountain there was an austrian climber who went out for a smoke at camp 2 and managed to get frostbite severe frostbite on all his fingers sadly all 10 fingers had to be amputated so moral of the story this is what we <laughs> we tell all our friends who smoke and uh, whenever we do a talk in a school we tell kids in a school to never ever smoke um so we came back and we got perhaps one of the best um the warmest welcomes ever in our lives we had about 200 people with a band who came out to the delhi airport to receive us um we were invited to meet the honorable president of india as a family my younger daughter is not here because um she was in switzerland doing um her hotel management course both dia and i were made brand ambassadors for the girl child in india uh, which is called beti bachao beti padhao uh, and we joked with the president of india save your daughter educate your daughter but also beti ko everest chadao make your daughter climb mount everest being um, symbolic in a way of encouraging our girls and um, helping them to dream big and then working with them to dream their uh, to uh, to um realize their dreams um our madness continues dia and i have climbed six of the seven mountain um seven summits the highest mountain on every continent we were to leave um, for denali on may 20th but of course um the last of our seven summits has been postponed to next year but we are really looking forward to it this is mount winson the highest mountain in antarctica there are two th there is something we have done in our lives that both dia and i believe that has taken us higher than mount everest uh, this is something very close to our heart after we skied across the greenland ice cap we raised money to sponsor these girls um well i'll tell you a little story so there was this children's home which had 200 boys boys whose parents have leprosy and uh, who were in a way ostracized from society but there were no girls and i took my daughters there uh, to sensitize them and uh, they asked me a question they said dad how come there are no girls here and i honestly did not have an answer but to cut a long story short after our greenland expedition we got in 12 girls to this children's home whose parents have leprosy and now this has grown to 36 girls who are now like our daughters and it's a wonderful feeling and this is something i do um, i started an ngo called planet harmony um which is essentially about dealing with kids from conflict areas in india we have mahatma gandhi as the father of our nation but still what disheartens me as an indian is to see conflict in our country people fighting with each other killing each other so we get in kids from kashmir the naxal affected areas um and through adventure we try and send them back home as ambassadors of peace and peaceful coexistence with that um, thank you so much and um, both dia and i would like to wish all of you health happiness and success higher than mount everest thank you
If you have any questions, um, I'll be very happy to answer them for you.